Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Fallen London. We are continuing with August's exceptional story Unto Dust and we are about to greet the reclusive heir She's going to keep me occupied for some time. You explain your purpose, his grandfather's funeral. At last, I thought the old demon meant to linger on in Vendorblight forever. The reclusive heir shuffles through some papers on his desk. I am sorry you've been dragged into all of this. He winces as an accounting ledger catches his eye. He pushes it off the desk like a cat with a priceless ornament. Aha! He locates the object of his search. The plans will adjourn to the drawing room and Mildred will serve Claret. It's the appropriate beverage for the occasion. He rises, his spurred boots thudding on the floorboards. I suppose I should be grateful he's taking any interest at all. He's never answered any of the letters I've sent asking for assistance in the past. The crimson drawing room of Ash Tree Hall is swathed in tapestries. Knights and unicorns, demons dance with death. A fire roars in the hearth, causing the room to smell pleasantly of fog and damp earth. The reclusive air has poured claret, spilling a little. Luckily, his voluptuous sleeves are scarlet. Papers and plans unroll over delicate coffee tables. We've already narrowed everything down to a few possibilities, the air says confidently. The housekeeper nods solemnly. We can consider the coffin in many ways the centerpiece of the whole event. Consider the guests, or we can consider the decor. Let's start at the top. We'll start with the coffin. We'll work our way down, I guess. We've narrowed the selection down to two, the reclusive air tells you. The finest we can provide, of course. You won't actually be using it. The reclusive air presents you with a glossy volume, courtesy of Recalitrants and Temper, Undertakers to the Aristocracy. Two entries in the catalogue have been circled by the air. So we can either select the Brass Casket, a contemporary coffin designed by functionaries from the Brass Embassy. Warm, velvet lined, gleams tastefully in the candlelight and can serve as a functional furnace if required. Or we can select the Ludicrous Sepulchre, a tomb in white marble, effigy upheld by weeping angels, gallant knights, leering popes, stern empresses, and a grinning death, complete with scythe. It is hideous. The reclusive heir loves it. I mean, I'm not going to lie, the ludicrous sepulchre sounds fantastic if I was going to get buried anywhere. Yeah, let's go with that one. I like that one. The reclusive heir actually claps his hands with delight. A flush appears on his pale cheek. Oh, I'm so glad you've picked this one. It'll be the centerpiece of the gallery. We can cover it in flowers in spring, a sprig of lavender for every statue. For the funeral, we can paint scarlet tears on the angels. The dependable housekeeper nods quietly, her lips drawn, as though already calculating the cost of its upkeep. Still, for better or worse, the coffin is decided. A complicating cause. The selection being made, there is another matter to attend to. The dependable housekeeper nudges the reclusive heir into broaching the topic. The Baron wishes the heir to attend his funeral with prospective spouse. Red faced, the heir mumbles through the assessment of the two best candidates, Claire C. Savoy an effervescent socialite with an acid tongue and a perchant for emeralds, and Ross Abernathy, a square-jawed lawyer, the toast of the city, and sober as a judge. I'm supposed to have dinner with both before I make a decision, he says. I'll need you as my chaperone. Okay, so we, let, let's start with, let's go with Clarice. I mean, if we have to go with both anyway, we may as well start with the one. Oh. A table at Dante's has been booked for the occasion. Clarice has requested fried jellyfish, lashings of champagne, and a promise that she can make up one lie about the air to tell her psychophants later. Clarice is a vision in Chartreuse. A drink. She also requests 
and in biles liberally. Her dinner conversation is pointed and wild, a gallop of poisonous bonmonts, innuendo, and displays of her own extravagant wealth. The reclusive heir is mostly silent through the dinner. Perhaps he is overwhelmed by her, perhaps he is completely mortified. Clarice pays him only moderate attention. Most of her showing off is aimed at you. Afterwards, the reclusive heir apologizes. He wanted to make me jealous, I think, he sighs. He has money, but no titles. You see why my estate would appeal, therefore. Okay. So she just kind of, she's rich, but has no standing. I Means she's trying to leverage her wealth to gain standing, which is a valid strategy, I suppose. Okay, let's consider the guests. Funerals are rare. Their rarity makes them exclusive events in the social calendar. There will be more wishing to attend than the hall can accommodate. The expectations around the Grand Baron's long-delayed funeral are very high. His heir's notorious reclusion has only increased the curiosity of London's tastemakers. The list of those wanting to attend outmatches the capacity of the hall. Careful selection will, therefore, be required. So we can invite the Grand Baron's cronies, industrialists, ministry men and women, devils and scientists, as well as inevitably a scattering of tomb colonists, people of consequence and significance. Or we can invite a gathering of artists and eccentrics. The reclusive heir has a list of his favourite poets, artists and actors. He's eager to meet them, and his grandfather's funeral seems the best excuse to do so. I think since it's the man's funeral, we should invite his friends, surely. Like, well, his sort of world, rather than just random people that Air yeah, wants to meet. The reclusive heir makes a face. Oh, will I have to talk to them? He looks to the dependable housekeeper for reassurance. He develops a sudden interest in her shoes. The air sighs. I suppose it will be something to see their faces when they step into the hall, he manages. They will be confronted with their own inadequacy and tastelessness. We should provide buckets for the weeping. The dependable housekeeper sighs and goes to find her her dress book. The Grand Baron knew a great many people in life, some of whom even liked him. Another selection made, another free evening for the reclusive heir to make dinner arrangements. One prospect already wined and dined, the other must now follow. The reclusive heir has donned his most preposterous suit for the occasion. It is mostly composed of frills. Do I look alright? he asks. That is no adequate answer possible. Okay, so we can chaperone the heir to di dinner with Ross. A table waits in an unpretentious restaurant near the inns of court. Ross has cleared a window in his calendar between midnight and two. Ross arrives on the hour and doles out compliments to both you and the heir in equal and exact measure. He takes an extended break during the soup to consult a witness he spotted at the adjoining table, and yawns when the reclusive heir breaks into raptures about a volume of celestial poetry he'd recently encountered. Ross is, however, very interested in the workings of the hall, its legal complexities and its management. It's a shame, he remarks over a glass of water, how the aristocracy let things go to rack and ruin. Ah, so he kind of wants to restore the manor to its previous glory, I guess? Well, we need to consider the decor. A funeral in London is as much a party as a farewell. The hall must look its very best. High society funerals in modern London are an extravagant affair. In spirit, they more resemble a wedding reception than a farewell to the deceased. Most hold their funerals when they leave for the tomb colonies for the first time, but the Grand Baron has delayed his until he's almost too decrepit to remain in Vendorblight. His will be held on the verge of his entrance to the Grand Sanatorium, the beginning of his permanent removal from society. The mood is thus more melancholic than most, and expectations have only been raised. We have a choice between host a red and white ball, a roaring, raucous ball featuring copious 
laudanum, chess piece costumes and an abundance of honey. A combination of the stately and the outer. It outrages the sensibilities of both the conservative and of the prudish. Or we can host a Venetian masked ball. Hideously old fashioned, tasteless and outplayed. A relic of the Grand Tour. The reclusive heir has an enormous collection of masks imported at ludicrous expense that he's dying for an occasion for. I am a sucker for masked balls. I don't think the Baron's going to like this very much because he likes to be at the forefront of technology and things but uh, and, and tastes. I think we're going to host a ball though. A masked ball. The reclusive heir gasps. Oh, I have dreamed of this and I won't have to see anybody's faces nor they mine. How wonderful! He pauses and frowns. Which mask? I shall have to give this some thought. Mildred, cancel all of my appointments until next week. He retreats from the room, leaving the arrangements with a dependable housekeeper. She confides in you that she means to attend as an empress. <laughs> okay. Declare your preparations finalized. The arrangements are in place. Now you just have to hope the Grand Baron enjoys his funeral. I got a funny feeling he's not gonna. The invitations have been sent. The dependable housekeeper is frantically redecorating the public rooms and working out how to make space for the coffin. All that remains is one final detail, one that the reclusive heir has hidden in his study to avoid. You find him ink-stained and surrounded by half-written letters. He is a paroxysm of decision paralysis. It's not a commitment, he says miserably. I'd just be doing what Grandfather wants, just for the day. I should try to make him happy. It is his funeral. He removes his wig to rake a hand through his thick blonde hair. But I really don't know who, who the right choice is. Oh, because we have that, we can, it can be us? Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, suggests Clarice, while she is impossible to tolerate, she is also tremendously wealthy. Her presence on the reclusive hair's arm will signal the security of his estate. Let's suggest Ross, practical and precise, and a lawyer to boot. What he lacks in prestige, he makes for up for in utility. He signals a modern approach to the estate. Or we can suggest ourselves. He's looking at you meaningfully, as though he had someone quite other than Clarice and Ross in mind. Let's go. We are totally doing that. I was wondering. I'm fairly sure Grandfather wouldn't approve. He hired you to assure his estate was in good hands, and it'd serve him quite right if you took advantage. He blushes. Not that you'd be taking advantage. In fact, I, I think I might quite like to be taken advantage of, uh, socially speaking. He looks extremely grateful when your answer prevents him from saying any more. Decision made. You spend the days leading to the party either assisting the dependable housekeeper who doesn't strictly need your help, but won't say no to a chance for a cup of tea and maybe a lie down, or dealing with a reclusive heir's artistic temperament. It's almost a mercy when the hour of the funeral arrives. This is going to be a mess. <laughs> Lights stream from every window in Ash Tree Hall. Candles blaze from every shelf. Ornaments and mantelpiece. Guests throng galleries, hallways and ballrooms, dressed for sombre extravagance. Mourners waltz around the coffin, while wine flows like blood pumping through the arteries of the funeral. Everyone comes in antique masks. The Moeta, the Harlequin, Columbiana, the Volto and Bauta, and of course the Plague Doctor. An array of colours parades through the hall, reflected in mirrors and refracted in the stained glass windows. The dependable housekeeper wears a crowned mask with a daring gown, while the reclusive heir bears a pale oval mask that weeps tears of blood. Oh, good job, Captain Edgy. <laughs> Everyone else has got these awesome masks, and he's there with just a pale oval mask that, with just blood tears coming down it. Out of all the things you could have picked, my dear friend. We can mingle. You organise this lavish funeral. It's time you enjoyed some of it. Huh. Ash Tree Hall is a riot of colour and laughter. 
music and the occasional breaking of glass. The funeral continues apace, lively and full-throated. You move between guests dressed as kings and others as lepers, maidens, monsters and knights errant. The hall resembles the pre-Raphaelite tableau or Venice, underground. For an evening things might be other than they are, and the hall is swathed in mystery. While we can mingle with the guests as a guest of honour, there are many here who wish a moment or more of your time. The conversation with an oily industrialist here, who has many thoughts on the Grand Baron's sharper elbowed business ventures. A tomb colonist speaks sadly of the fate that overcame the Baron's children. Things are livened by a gossipy interlude between a socialite and a devilus, discussing the legacy of the Baron's investments over Z. Among friends and rivals, the Baron is remembered as a titan with an iron will. Few mourn, but all acknowledge the spurs he kicked into London's industry, and the futures he has ma made possible. Call for re reinforcements? There's still time to add to the festivities, to the health of the evening? Or to its deterioration, not everything has to be planned in advance. Couples spin around the coffin in elaborate costume, dressed as popes and actors, murmurs at the feast. Music fills the halls, loud enough to wake the dead. Drink flows like water, and honey is consumed in excess. The perfect London funeral. But perhaps something is missing. There are a few leftover invitations from late cancellations, and those too dull or dead to reply. You'd use them now. In London, someone's always ready to attend a party. Let's send for a brace of devils. They would lend the evening an air of sophistication and frisson of daring. We could get the clergy. It would splash of holy water over proceedings. No one likes to get too carried away while a vicar is watching. This will bring a somber air to the funeral. We don't want somber, we want crazy, so let's get some devils. The devils arrive in an array of tasteless costumes. Renaissance angels, apostles, and saints. Tonight, their gold wigs and startlingly accurate finery declare them nothing is sacred. The guests gasp in delight as the embassy's own band strikes up in the ballroom, the saxophonist playing from the top of the sarcophagus. <laughs> the evening descends into wild, sinful Abaddon. Wow. How this goes. So, let's search for the reclusive hour, I suppose. You spotted him moments ago, but he is nowhere to be found. There are murmurs on every stair and along every corridor. The health of the funeral depends on his presence. A cursory search of Ash Tree Hall turns up nothing. A swathe of figures in jeweled masks and bright feathers offer unhelpful directions. Only the tolling of a doleful bell provides a clue to his location. You find him in the hall's lone bell tower, surrounded by an array of books and a glass of claret. The air smiles as you approach. I was reading about some wonderful parties, he says, sighing with pleasure. The ambience below is just right for it. So we can either encourage him out, there will be time for reading later, there is a party happening in his hall now, the guests are hungry for his appearance, or we can let him stay. What harm is he doing up here? He seems content, and there is a cafe of claret by his side. He is well provisioned for the evening, I will encourage him out. He explains how crucial the juncture in his reading was. Just another minute. If you go down first, why, he'll be down in moments. You will not go back to the party without him, however. Will he have the spoiling of your enjoyment on his conscience? At last, he tosses his book aside and stands. Fine, he says, visibly restraining himself from stamping his foot. But I shan't enjoy myself. There is applause as he re-enters the ballroom. You leave him as a host of glittering guests converges on him, like peacocks around a lost chick. Okay, so the only thing we have left now is attending to toasts, the main event of the funeral, where those who knew the soon to be departed offer their farewells and fond remembrances, or reignite old grievances in poose-faced spite. The most important moment in any funeral are the toasts.
The final farewells. A sculptural remarks and the last send-offs to the new tomb colonist on their way to Vendorblight. The honour of the main toast is given to one closest to the somewhat deceased. Before the speeches begin, you'll need to decide who makes the final closing speech. However, a man in a tomb colonist mask follows you near the coffin. Taking off his mask, the man is revealed to be the Grand Baron. I shall take it from here, he informs you, looking at the podium meaningfully. I have a speech prepared. I mean... So we do have a choice here, we can... <laughs> We can ask the Grand Baron to give a toast. It is considered extremely gauche for one to even attend one's own funeral. But as he's here, you may as well make the best of it. Or we can ask the reclusive heir to give a toast. He is, after all, the last remaining relative of the almost deceased. Or we can ask the dependable housekeeper to give a toast. Although not a relative, he is known as the Baron better than most. He is, however, swaying somewhat. Nerves, no doubt. This is a dis this is a like a hard choice because. Speaking at your own funeral seems slightly pointless. You're just going to remind people of how great you were. I think we're going to ask the dependable housekeeper. Because the reclusive heir will just say something ridiculous because he's just not good at this sort of thing. And like the, the housekeeper's just been here the whole time in the background in the shadows waiting for her time. So I think we're going to give it to her. Grand Baron, put out by not being asked, takes a seat at the front of the room. He listens to the speeches given by others, those which lavish plaudits on his character and buff his reputation to gleeping. Then, at last, the housekeeper arrives at the podium, swaying like a galleon in full sail. She begins by finishing her glass and immediately calling for another. The, el the elix cheers. Oh dear. Next, she launches into an unbridled character assassination of her former employer, the savagery of which causes gasps across the room. When she calls the Grand Baron the worst man in London not yet hanged, the room breaks into applause, led by the Grand Baron himself. She is a palpable hit. <laughs> Amazing. I suppose there is an argument to a uh, roasting at someone's funeral. Especially if they're alive to see it. But we can bring the funeral to a close. It has been a roaring success. The Grand Baron has been seen off to the sanatorium in such a style that even he couldn't complain. The guests depart in high spirits, all agreeing that this was a funeral to remember. Several say pointedly to their loved ones that when the time comes, they hope that theirs will be half so good. The dependable housekeeper collapses into a chair, leaving the tidying for tomorrow. The reclusive heir, exhausted by the crowds, retreats into his study. The Grand Baron is nowhere to be seen. He has, however, left a letter on the drawing room mantelpiece. It is a legal summons for the three of you, an appointment in Vendorblight to hear the outcome of his will. A carriage will be waiting in the morning. The funeral is at last at an end. The guests have left, most voluntarily. The hall is quiet, but for the ticking of the carriage clocks on the mantelpieces, the low tolling of the hourly bell, and the gentle snores of the dependable housekeeper. We could invite the reclusive heir to attend to you. The night is young, the hall is vast. Perhaps he could show you some of it. Or we can go to bed. It has been a long day. The heir can manage his own affairs for once. Now let's, let's have a... Uh, let's see the estate. The reclusive heir rubs his eyes and affects alertness. Together you tour the old galleries, the lengthy wine cellars, the secret gardens and dusty ballrooms. The games room in one of the towers, filled with ancient toys, dolls, houses and chessboards. We pass the evening together, redecorating one of the houses. It is late into the night, when you at last retire. The air lingering as he bids you good night outside your guest room. He smiles as he walks away, his candle flickering in the gloom. 
As promised, a carriage is waiting outside Ash Tree Hall in the morning. Black plumbed horses and a surely coachman wait to spirit you, the heir and the housekeeper away. The reclusive heir is pale from nerves or drink. The dependable housekeeper, however, is undeterred. I haven't had a holiday in years, she says, opening the coach door. Well, let's embark. The matter of the will is in hand, waiting with the Grand Baron. In Vendorblight. The horses are swift, the coachman too eager from the whip. The dependable housekeeper's attempt at a crossword is soon ink blotted and ruined. The reclusive air is increasingly green looking. Next is the ferry, a private one, chartered at the some ungodly expense. The furnishings below deck are plush, if funeral. The dark waters of the Z lap hungrily as at the ferry as you make the crossing. At last you arrive at the somber, silent docks of Vendorblight, where bandaged porters wait to usher you into the realm of the almost dead. The journey is not over, however. Another coach, white as death, waits. The bandaged coachman is no less fast with his whip as you rattle south through the flow stone forest, that impossible maze of stalactites. Blindfolds are provided here, for the safety of visitors. The coachman helps you down from the coach and guides you down a set of shallow steps. The gates clang as they close behind you. At last you are permitted to remove the blindfold. We can look around, where, where are we? You stand in the pale, cold vaults of the Grand Sanatorium, the final convalescence of many tomb colonists. The entrance is as vast as a Roman artorium, and as well guarded as a prison. The Grand Baron is waiting here. He gives you a brisk handshake, from which you recover an errant finger and return it to him and a familiar nod to the dependable housekeeper. He ignores his heir entirely. Two great bronze doors open in front of you. You are escorted into a colossal courtroom which resembles an ancient temple in decoration, staffed by aged tomb colonists. A judge gazes down at you from a flaking bronze bench. There has, he says in a voice of dust, been an irregularity. No one may enter the Grand Sanatorium while retaining ties to the old world, the judge rasps. Yet you are here. The Grand Baron protests that he has brought his guests here in order to give up his estate over. Give up his estate over. But he is silenced by the judge. There is an irregularity in the will. The Grand Baron has made two wills, both naming a different heir, witnessed on the same date, but by two different parties. The first will he has brought with him, the second he ordered Pentforth and Revolt to send ahead. Oops, says the Baron cheerfully. Listen to the presiding judge's sentence. This will determine whether the Grand Baron is permitted to pass into the Grand Sanatorium. The sentence takes hours in which you are not permitted to speak. The judge takes lengthy consultations with other bewigged tomb colonists, their voices hoarse whispers, echoing in the great vault of the court. At one point, the housekeeper asks if she may pop to Vendorblight for a cup of tea. The judge glares at her, closes his book of proceedings, and starts again from the beginning. At last, a decision is reached. Legally, the Grand Baron cannot give up his property and enter the sanatorium. However, actually, he is already here. A lengthy disputation in London would be embarrassing and time-consuming, and the Baron cannot be allowed to leave in his condition. He is almost dead and thus belongs in the sanatorium. 
As such, the judge has a solution. All present will be detained in the Grand Sanatorium to resolve the matter themselves. This, he makes clear, includes you. Ow balls! <laughs> From his bronze seat, the judge lays out the facts of the case. Two wills, two heirs, same date, same horrible mess. His desiccated eyes burn into the Grand Baron, who merely grins. There is a solution, however, the judge rattles in his voice of dust. Let's hear the judge's sentence. Perhaps there is an end to this entanglement. Everyone that the Grand Baron has brought to see him off is involved in the case, with one exception. You. As an impartial body unaffiliated with the court or the case, you will serve as legate the court of silent sorrow and mediate this difficulty. The judge makes clear this is an obligation. You will not see London again until your task is completed. You must, therefore, find a way to resolve the matter of the Baron's inheritance so that he may be properly interred with all his legal assets divested. The Grand Baron gives you a wink as the sentence is passed. But I am afraid that I am going to have to end this episode here in well, apparently trapped in the Court of Sorrows. My favourite place to end an episode. But thank you very much for watching. Please like, subscribe, let me know what you think. Your comments are greatly appreciated. And as always, I'll see you next time.